Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, I want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to this wonderful country. Um, I think my so far everything that I have seen far exceeded my expectation. I was very impressed by the breathtaking natural beauty of this country and more humbled by your hospitality. So I have no disclosures on this except that I enjoy a good glass of wine sometimes. And after seeing your coffee plantation, I think I understood more of the subtleties of coffee making. And maybe I should focus more on coffee than wine in the future. So I would start with a case history. A young man who is a stockbroker comes to the hospital with new onset of jaundice. He has now used drugs and admitted that he also enjoyed a good glass of wine, probably more frequently than I would. When he came, his total bilirubin was high, direct bilirubin also was high, AST was 212, ALT 70, alkaline phosphate is just above the upper limit of normal. INR was three times above the upper limit of normal. And when you look at the CBC, you see that MCV was marginally higher and platelets lower. And ultrasound shows steatosis. So many of us who are gastroenterologists here would say, most likely this guy has alcoholic hepatitis because the AST-ALT ratio is high, red blood cells are slightly bigger, and we may also say he may have significant fibrosis or even cirrhosis because of low platelets. So when you take the history, in my own experience over the years, most people, whether it's men or women, they don't want to admit how much they drink. They underestimate and they may be social drinkers, they think, or they may say they drink at work because of their obligation to their customers. So this is the topic I'm going to discuss. It is more common than you would anticipate. It is the third leading cause of death in the world. It causes considerable morbidity and mortality. It is the most common cause of marital problems, unemployment, road traffic accident. And you'll see when you look at the media, most people talk about things that alcohol can do to you. And as this one said, sometimes we do things which we otherwise would not do under the effect of alcohol. But if you look at our American media, the major income during the football season is from advertisement of beer. And young college students think it is normal to drink six or 12 cans of beer during a football game. And even our leaders sometimes have added to this. As once as Benjamin Franklin said, beer is the living proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. Winston Churchill during the war day said, Always remember that I have taken more out of alcohol than alcohol has taken out of me. And Frank Sinatra, alcohol may be the man's worst enemy, but the Bible says, love your enemy. So you see the media, media sometimes underestimate the morbidity and mortality caused by alcohol. When you look at the world map, you will see the developed countries of the world have been consuming large amount of alcohol in the past. But the developing, the low and middle income countries are catching up very fast. When I looked at the consumption pattern in Colombia, there are very limited data, but a bulletin of the World Health Organization suggested that it is somewhat similar to United States of America about eight liters of absolute alcohol per person in this country per year. So for every 
one liter increase on alcohol consumption, one would expect a 14% increase in cirrhosis in men and about 8% increase in women. So these are some of the data from the bulletin of the World Health Organization. In Colombia, one death every two minutes because of alcohol, and it is represent 9.2% of all deaths in this region. And as I said, alcohol pattern looks similar to that of the United States. 60% of traffic accidents in Colombia are related to alcohol. So you might say, what am I going to talk about to you today? Whatever I'm going to talk today is never going to have an impact on the epidemiology or the health burden related to alcohol. It is just like a small band-aid on a huge problem that we see worldwide. The only way we can reduce consumption of alcohol is by regulation and taxation. Many people have studied that. And regulation and taxation will have a major impact on the alcohol consumption pattern. So going to the medical part of it, that's why we are here as physicians. Our role is to treat the patients who come to us. When you see alcoholism, we see that majority of these patients will have fatty liver disease. And in many parts, my, many of my colleagues sometimes see fatty liver and call that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because they never take a history or they don't suspect alcoholism. But when you look at these fatty liver patients, about 20% will have alcoholic hepatitis and about 15%. But a third of the patients with fatty alcoholism will have significant injury to the liver. How do we make the diagnosis? It is a clinical diagnosis. It is a clinical syndrome. Patients may present with new onset of jaundice, might have had history of alcoholism for many, many years. Sometimes, at least in the hospitalized patients, low-grade fever is very common. They may present with ascites, hepatomegaly, hepatic encephalopathy. Usually, patients are in the middle age. That's the peak incidence. Men more common than women, but men, women are more susceptible to the alcohol effect. One of the key things you have may notice in these patients, the AST-ALT ratio. I think even if they refuse or they say deny alcoholism, some of my patients say they never touch alcohol. And then their spouses say that they go to the basement of the house and don't appear for many hours. You will pick most of these patients with alcoholic hepatitis whom you may have suspected have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The reason for this AST ALT ratio may be many. Maybe because of decreased hepatic ALT levels or increase in mitochondrial AST levels in the liver. When you see symptomatic alcoholic hepatitis, if you were to do a biopsy, half of them will have cirrhosis. And even with mild alcoholic hepatitis, if they were to follow them, 50%, irrespective of whether they drink or not, will develop cirrhosis. But if they abstain from alcohol completely, about a quarter, 25%, the histology will return to normal. The most important aspect is Recidivism is extremely common. Two thirds, two out of three of your patients with alcoholic hepatitis will restart drinking. In my practice, I tend to use baclofen recently. There was a paper in Lancet many years ago. Baclofen is commonly used for spasm, so it is a relatively safe drug. I start with five milligram three times a day, increase to 10 milligram, and sometimes it helps to prevent the recidivism. When you see patients with alcoholic hepatitis, the question is, how do we predict their prognosis? One of the earlier studies from Hopkins showed that Madry score, Wills, Wills Madry was one of the co-authors of the study, could predict those who are high mortality. It's very easy to calculate. You multiply 4.6 times the difference between the prothrombin time and the control, and add serum bilirubin in milligram. If it is more than 32, 
the mortality is 30% at 30 days. And if they have encephalopathy, they also have a high mortality. Many other models have been developed since then. Glasgow hepatic score, alcoholic hepatitis score, very rarely used. And more recently, MELD, because it's easy to use, we use MELD sometimes. If it is more than 21, they have a one in five chance of dying. Lily's score, I will come to it in more detail later on, was developed mainly to assess the prognosis when patients are treated with prednisone. So how good is MADRI score? Many, many studies have been looked at it. MADRI score is quite robust in predicting the mortality. In this study, if you were on a, if your MELD score is more than 32, more than, uh, your mortality or the survival is 72% versus 93% if the MELD score is less than 32. This is 30 days mortality. So how do we manage it? I think it's easy to talk about the prediction. Is there anything we can do to these patients? In the earlier studies, nutritional assessment was tested. Nutritional supplementation was tested. But the data are very discordant because many of our patient population are not nutritionally depleted. The current standard of care is use of prednisone. The, if the MADRI score is more than 32, you treat them with the prednisone, 40 milligram for 28 days. And if you look at many studies, they've shown that those, if you select the patients by MADRI score, the treated group will do better than the placebo group. Some of the earlier studies, there was a 30% difference in the treatment group compared to the placebo group. But more importantly, if the patients do not respond to prednisone, about half the patients won't respond to prednisone, they have a 70% mortality at six months. So you are selecting a group of patients who will, who will have very high risk of dying. Other treatments that have been tested are pentoxifilin, and we have tested, and a TNF, I have to say that it has not worked. At least in one of the studies, it was withdrawn early because of the higher risk of death in the treated group. And acetylcysteine, I will show you some data on that. And more importantly and controversial, liver transplant for alcoholic hepatitis. So what about the short-term effect? I'm going to, next two, three slides, I will show you data showing consistent results that if you select patients, high risk of dying, that is mad risk score, more than 32, you are going to see a benefit in the treated group. In the, one of the earlier studies, New England Journal of Medicine, the difference was almost 40%. Tr treated group did much better than placebo. And the same group have done many other studies and in the bottom part of the graph, they had a randomized group and then a non-randomized group. Either way, when you look at it, when you look at the placebo or untreated arm, there is a difference of 30% mortality. And the later study, the same group, as he's seen, about 20%. This is all the short-term mortality. So we can modify the short-term mortality by giving a course of steroid. What about other forms of drug? Pendoxifilin has been tested. This was one of the earlier studies published in gastroenterology. You can see a difference in survival. And if you look at this graph, you can see that the survival difference was noticed earlier on in the treatment, the first four to six weeks. After that, the curves are almost parallel. And when you look at this study, what they reported that hepatorenal syndrome was lower in the treated group with pendoxifilin. So it seems to have some protective effect against hepatorenal syndrome. But a Cochrane database analysis of some five good studies showed that data are not as robust as we want to be, not like prednisone. Although the mortality was reduced by 36% when you combine the data, the, it, the, the investigators or the authors thought that the data are not as good to suggest pendoxifilin as a first-line therapy. So, but it could be used when 
prednisone or corticosteroid is contraindicated. I alluded to this study, an anti-TNF agent, because if you look at the path pathogenesis of alcoholic hepatitis, TNF plays an important role. So if you block the TNF, we thought that we can reverse the process. But earlier study showed that if you were to use anti-TNF, they have a high risk of dying from infection. So what do we do? We, uh, early days, we said four weeks of prednisone. But a French group, they are the one who have done some of the, uh, most of the studies in this area. They found that if you look at serum bilirubin at day zero, the day you start the prednisone, and compare with day seven, if there is no decrease in serum bilirubin, it is not worth treating them anymore. And in this study, they showed that on the left-hand side, patients with early change in bilirubin, their mortality was much lower than those who did not have early change. So the early improvement in bilirubin is an important predictor. So after a week or two, if they're not responding to prednisone, you cut the losses and stop the prednisone. And from that, they developed what we now know as Lilly score. Lilly score used six variables, and they also used bilirubin at day zero and day seven. Using this model, they found that they can predict 90% of the patients you know, whether they are going to survive or not. And in this study, if the Lilly score is more than 0.45, this scoring system is available on the website. You can put the numbers, serum below all those numbers, and you will get a score. And you, if you were to treat the patient with prednisone, you wait for seven days of treatment. And if you were, the, the score is more than 0.45, the mortality is 85% versus 25. So we are refining our uh, treatment modality. Prednisone has side effects. So if you were to treat them, treat them for the first one week and look at the bilirubin or even if you, you can look at the Lilly score. And if they are not responding, you may stop them and maybe give other forms of treatment or even consider a liver transplant. So it is an excellent predictor of survival at day one. And if your non-response is defined by a score more than 0.45. And this has helped them, help at least a hepatologist to define how we should treat. On this curve on the right-hand side, you can see if those who had prednisone at the score more than 0.45, if you were to continue treating them with prednisone, there is no difference. So might as well stop the treatment at V7. Say day seven in those who do not respond to corticosteroids. This was a study they wanted to look at. What if we were to treat this group, those who did not respond with pentoxifilin, would it give you an advantage? Because one of the studies showed that combining prednisone with pentoxifilin earlier on did not improve the survival. So this is the basis of their study. And it is a two-step strategy. First, they treated the prednisone, and if they fail the treatment, a group was treated with pentoxifilin. And they compared with a historical control, match controls. And you can look at this data, pentoxifilin. If the patients failed prednisone, adding pentoxifilin did not improve their outcome. What about n acetyl cysteamine? We use it for acetaminophen or paracetamol overdose. It replace the antioxidant system. So this was a controlled trial, early trial. Everybody had nutrition plus or minus n acetyl cysteamine. As you can see, there was a trend. This was not statistically significant, showing that n acetyl cysteamine improved the outcome of this patient. What, as I said, corticosteroid adding with pentoxifilin did not help. A cocktail of antioxidants did not help either. So this was the recent study. It was presented two years at ESL and published in New England Journal recently. They had a large cohort of patients with discriminant function or MADRI score more than 32, histology confirming alcoholic hepatitis. One group received corticosteroid alone. Other received corticosteroid and five days of intravenous N-acetyl cysteamine. 
And this is a very complex uh, slide, but I wouldn't go into that. And they want to find the com combination group of NSTL cystiamine. Uh, the first day they got a higher dose, and the rest four days they got 100 mil microgram, milligram per kilogram body weight. And when you look at the data, the com combination group did much better than the prednisone group. And this was, this mortality difference was obvious at month one and month two. So there is a difference in mortality. So based on this, I would say the current standard of care in patients with advanced alcoholic hepatitis defined as a discriminant function more than 32, maybe a short-term treatment with prednisone and estyl cystiamine. And if the Lilly score or the serum bilirubin does not improve after day seven, you may stop the treatment and think about other strategies. The problem is we have no other strategy. Liver transplant is highly controversial in this group. Same group from France, they challenged that. They looked at a subgroup, carefully selected. It is 2% of their entire population of alcoholic hepatitis. They listed for liver transplant on a basis of consensus. That means social and other comorbidities. They thought it was okay to go do transplant. And in that selected group, the six-month survival was excellent. So they did very well. And we knew that for years, that we knew that we, the reason we are not offering liver transplant is not because they won't survive, because there is a moral and an ethical uh, debate going on whether we should be giving them liver transplant. So this was uh, published in New England Journal recently, and when you look at the treated group, they did as good as those who responded to prednisone or NSTL cystiamine. So in a selected patient population, one could say, we could consider liver transplant. That has to be taken case by case. I discussed the short-term outcome of patient. What do they do long-term? And this was the basis of a study. Same group looked at number of their study, combined the data. So they had 272 patients with severe alcoholics treated over a period of time. Six-month survival responders defined by Lilly's score was excellent. Non-responders, 75% died. But when they sub-analyzed the group, and if they overall five-year survival was very low, 32%. You might wonder what happened because many of them started drinking again. If they responded and abstained from alcohol, five-year survival was 80%. And if they responded and started drinking again, 70% died. And if they didn't respond and then drank, 100% died. So Recidivism is common in patients. So even if they survive the short term, you need to have a long-term strategy for this patient. You need to have a counseling program and also may use some agents, just as baclofen, to prevent recidivism. And also you need the social support to prevent recidivism. So in conclusion, we have come a long way this is not like going to the moon, as Dr. Martin said, but we are making baby steps here. In a selected patient population, we can improve the survival by treating them with corticosteroid and NSTL cystamine. And in a subgroup that cannot take prednisone, we could try pendoxifilin. And if they don't respond after a week of treatment, in a highly selected basis, we may think of liver transplant. As I alluded to earlier, whatever we are going to do with alcoholic liver disease is not going to make an impact on the natural history of alcoholism. For that, we need our governments to do regulations and higher taxation. Thank you.